Lord, as we gather together this afternoon in the name of your son, we do pray that you would take the initiative, that you would draw our hearts and our minds to you, that you would pry open, O oh Lord, the places that we have sealed shut, afraid, that you would open our hearts and minds to new ways. Thank you, O oh Lord, that we can turn to you, that we can trust you in you and know that you who open your heart wide to us will love us, receive us, and fill us. Speak to us, Lord, for your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. One of the people I like to follow is a man by the name of Dr. David Taylor. He is the assistant professor of missions at Fuller Theological Seminary. And he wrote this not too long ago. He said, our political atmosphere, like a psychotropic drug gone nightmarishly wrong, has made us mad in the head and wildly reactive. The media play into this on the left and on the right. They wind us up and throw us intentionally into emotional tailspins, even while they keep us addicted to finding the next news of the day. That feels like my household. In the midst of all of that, as well as all of the tensions that are going on right now in the life of our culture that you know as well as I do, it puts us actually in a rather unenviable position, at least if we aren't interested in being co-opted by any of the sides that are so much a part of our culture. Because if you make the decision to say, I want to stand for the gospel, which means you're never entirely at home in either the political left or the political right, and that there always is a gap between the good news of the kingdom in anyone's political platform, and particularly now when there's so much politicalization of you name the issue. In that atmosphere, no matter what you say, no matter how carefully you say it, no matter what you do, however thoughtful or lovingly done, they, whomever they are, will always have somebody to get mad at, and it's usually you. They'll think ill of you, they'll judge you hastily, and they will not give you a fair shake. That is, in fact, the natural reaction of someone who is being emotionally jerked around. They don't have the capacity to think clearly. And the more fearful the ante is raised, the more likely they are to cling to whomever is speaking the truth that causes them to feel the most in control. Well, where does that leave you when Jesus says, unless you take up your cross and follow me? You, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing about being in control about that. And so as a result, we don't necessarily bring a lot of good news to people who need, in fact, assurance that their efforts to try to keep their life under some kind of control is, in fact, a kind of fruitless enterprise. In the midst of all of this, we give thanks for the life of Luke and the poet, British poet, Malcolm Geat, says this about Luke's gospel. Luke is the living pillar of our healing, a lowly ox the servant of the four. We turn his page to find his face revealing wonder and the welcome of the poor. He breathes good news to all who bear burdens, good news to all who turn and try again. The meek rejoice, the prodigals find pardon, a lost thief reaches paradise through pain, and the voiceless find their voice, and with Our Lady magnify the Lord. There's a weaving in the Gospel of Luke, a treasure of what is being imparted to us that we would be the poorly for if we did not have it. 
But as I read Luke's gospel, which I love, by the way, I'm, const I'm just constantly sensing that there is, at least in me, on the one hand, the tension, the desire to be in control, the orientation toward the accomplishing of things that somehow bolster my sense of purpose, um, no matter how minuscule they might be. If there's a lot of tension in your life, you'll be very surprised how satisfying a hedge looks when it's even after you've clipped it. So desperate we can be to get some sense of accomplishment in the midst of the kind of unending work that never seems to end in dealing with ornery, hungry, unhappy people like us. So there's the wonder, there's the frustration, both of which I say I find inside of me. And the more I turn to the Lord and ask to make room in my life for more wonder and for less stress, um, it's not always, in fact, a welcome work that Jesus does. Stanley Hauerwas puts it this way, through the story of Jesus, I can increasingly learn to be what I am being made by the Spirit of God, a participant in God's community of peace and justice. But only by growing into that story do I learn how much violence I continue to have stored in my soul. Violence which is not about to vanish overnight, but which, but which I must continually work to recognize and lay down again and again and again. And in fact, I think the reason some of us, myself included, are so resistant in, dif in finding so much difficulty is that we don't want to do the work of digging down more deeply in our hearts, of asking the Holy Spirit to, un to reveal, to open up the places that we have closed because of fear, to examine long-held presumptions about what is or is not true about us or about other people. Quoting Martin Luther King, John Meacham in his biography of John Lewis says, the more I think about human nature, the more I see how tragic our inclination for sin is, causing us to use our minds to rationalize our actions instead of repent. Reason devoid of the purifying power of faith can never free itself from distortions or rationalizations, which is why getting into an argument or even merely a conversation about whether or not using a mask is a weapon to defeat Donald Trump is actually a fruitless enterprise. It's fruitless. You will not convince people otherwise, no matter what it is that you have to say, they, you just, to say because there is in them, and you see in us too, a need to find reassurance in anything that we can grasp, especially control. Rowan Williams put it this way, not particularly encouraging. If you think devotional practices and theological insights, even charitable actions, give you purchase with God, then you're still just playing games. And therefore, to be invited into that place where we ask God to work in us, the kind of healing that we see present in the gospel is, in fact, to find a way to say yes to a life marked primarily by repentance and by risk. You see, a person who is repentant is someone who is learning to be free from pretense, from evasion, free from the need to always win every argument, or even most, free from the need to defend herself, free from the need to try to expose other people. And it's not easy to keep at it, to allow God to pry apart from me the things that I wish were true, whether that be about myself or someone else, that in fact are not. For us, particularly who are called as clergy, who are called to speak the truth in love, our only recourse our only resource 
is the priestly ministry of Jesus who takes away the sins of the world, who bears the burdens and the brokenness that is all around us, including that which is in us. But to know somehow that Jesus bears my burdens, that Jesus forgives the sins, including the ones that I cannot forgive myself, that Jesus has great power over the places where I'm feeling, in fact, the most powerless actually begins to set me free to no longer need to prove myself right, to no longer find the need to win somebody else's approval. You know, plenty of us live our lives literally looking in the mirror, even if there isn't a mirror, we are looking for the reflection in somebody else's eyes that turns around and says, you know, you're okay, did a good job, well done, keep trying. And when we don't see that, it throws many of us into a tailspin. A part of what the nature of ordination is, is that it draws men and women who need to be needed. It is a personality trait in almost anyone who says yes to the call to ordination because the demands, and they know it, we know it, are high, and we need the challenge, and we need to be involved in the lives of other people in a way that actually makes a remarkable God being our helper difference in their lives. That, that's the need to be needed. So today, as we give thanks for the life of Luke, we're saying yes to the priestly ministry of Jesus because above all, we need it. We need it. And the more we can receive from it, the more our hearts can begin to be broken open and restored and built up, the more we have the capacity to be able to be present in the lives of other people with at least a less and less need to prove ourselves. You see, if I'm always trying to prove myself, no matter what that might look like, okay, be compassionate now, Greg. They're trying to tell you things that are important to them. The more I'm actually concerned with my own inner actions, and as a result, the less emotionally available I am to the person who is with me at that very point of need. O oh, wounded hands of Jesus, build in us thy new creation. That's, it seems to me, what it is that we long for. Because when I begin to know more and more about freedom and forgiveness in my life, it gives me, in fact, the capacity to be able to pay attention, to be able to see to be able to pay attention to the movement in somebody's face, not as a technique, but to pay attention to what's actually being communicated to me in the midst of that conversation, to wonder what they're not saying, to look at the glance in their eyes when they rest, even if it's just for a second, on a particular word, knowing in that pause there is a clue they're trying to hope you notice that will hopefully give you what you need to be asked the question of them that they don't have the courage to ask you, but are still hoping beyond hope that you will still ask because you see them, because you notice them, because you're there by the mercy of God to serve them, no matter what it is that's going on inside of you. I mean, everybody I know has had this experience. You're at home, and God knows what might have happened. Your kid could have thrown everything against the wall. Your wife could be yelling at you or your husband. The world could be falling apart. You could have gotten the call that you wish you'd never have gotten about somebody going on in your life as you are making your way to the office to be available for somebody to talk to you. And they, they have no idea about your personal life. Honestly, they don't care all that much. They're there for them. And your job in that moment is to be available. And it is an act of grace. It is an act of the servant ox that is Luke 
to be able to say, Lord, how can I serve you? It's an act of trust. It's an act, I mean, and even in the smallest things, you may have noticed, Monday uh, after I got here, I was uh, running around because I couldn't find a file. And it was a file that had everything I needed for today. And I got in touch with everybody in the world trying to think about what happened. And in the midst of all of that, as I'm sort of dashing around trying to find that file, getting more and more phonetic, of course, people are coming up to say hello. It was all I could do to sort of say, to stop and go, hi, because I really wanted to see people. I didn't want the freneticism of the file to take over my life. And just as God would have it, by the time I made it my way back to the room and got on my Twitter feed, all of the Bible verses that were being quoted by my friends was, trust in the Lord. Well, the Lord provided. But it's a constant issue, it seems to me if we're going to genuinely say yes to the servanthood of Jesus, to be available for God to use us wherever we find ourselves, there is always going to be that sense of laying down a part of what it is that is important to me, no matter how innocuous, and have the eyes to notice what people are not telling you, to pay attention to the glance that they're hoping that you're catching even though they will never, ever say so. Because it is exactly that kind of posture that is where the empowering spirit of God actually begins to happen. It's not in the places where you're feeling confident and assured. It is not in the places where you're feeling in control. Some of us are really good masters. We can get a lot done if we know how to use the resources that are available to us. And in those play, and that's what gets, that's what gets our admiration so that we're known as somebody who gets things done. That's just about the best accolade that any of us can ever receive because it says something about how we manage power, and that is the currency of this culture. And so if we're known in the church as somebody who gets things done, quote, unquote, that says we get what power's like. We know the human dynamic. We know how to find the right guy. I know a guy the right person, the right capacity to be able to build things together, to do things that other less talented people might not be able to get. And it is, in fact, the mark of most clergy of any, of any size in terms of their congregation. You don't typically get the larger churches if you can't do that. And I say not, do not say that to our credit. Because we are, in fact, a culture that idolizes power, money, status, and yet for us to come with an open heart to try to pay attention to the people who are, in fact, the objects of the gospel. Did you notice? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to who? The poor, to proclaim release to who? The captives, not the well-adjusted. The recovery of sight not to the people who are perceptive, but to the blind. Not to create a group of well-adjusted people who already know how to get along, but to in fact speak in such a way that the oppressed go free. And out of that to proclaim to this ragtag bunch that almost no one would want to pay attention to, the year of the Lord's favor. That's what it means, you see to express the healing power of Jesus. I'm utterly convinced that one of the reasons, at least in some of our churches, where there is an absence of the presence of the miraculous is because the people who are in the pews typically don't always need it very much. They want to feel better, of course, but not the kind of miraculous, radical change that reorients them into a life empowered by the Holy Spirit, available God to, for God to use, wherever they are, whomever is in front of them, regardless of race, ethnicity, job, impressive or not. In fact, all of those within the kingdom actually matter very, very little. Because no matter who they are, God is giving you the room to stop and to pay attention. 
And out of that, the healing mercies of Jesus flow. Sisters and brothers, Luke challenges me to the core. It challenges my idea of success. It challenges my idea of what good ministry actually looks like. It challenges my idea of what completion looks like in a human being. <laughs> because we're not promised that until we get to the other side of the kingdom. Instead, what we're invited into is a poverty-stricken place of abject need that causes us at every turn, more often than we, are, we wish weren't there, to cry out to God for his mercy because that's all we've got. We don't have anything else. And if God is going to do that in us, it means he'll put us in places of genuine suffering, real extreme. I mean, I could not resonate more deeply with the things that Rick Thorpe has been saying about going through stuff and what it produces in your life and the capacity as a result to be available for God to use you in ways that you or I would never even imagine. And believe me, if that's what it takes to reproduce the works, life, character, and spiritual power of Jesus in us, we would be fools not to say yes even to calamity. So in this day, <laughs> where a lot's being exposed, where things that we wish weren't coming to the surface actually are, where fault lines are happening in the lives of people, where we're feeling weary and worn down because we can't produce in the ways that we normally do. So we're not getting the accolades that we're used to because we can't find a way to do church as normal. Brothers and sisters, I don't think we're going to have much normal anytime soon. I have no plans to go back to normal. None. It's only, okay, Lord, you're here and you're, you're calling us to serve. What does that mean now? And now, however, I need to be remade or you need to be remade to meet the need of the hour according by a divine appointment to the Spirit of God, it is to that we are called to say yes. That somehow in the midst of this chaos, what is arising is a group of people who are marked by humility, by tender care, and by profound spiritual power. So all they have to do is touch and pray, and lives are changed. That's the promise of the Gospel of Luke. So for that, I am more than willing to say yes. I do not know what, is, what that is going to cost us. I don't think we've seen it yet. But I do believe that we, if we are serious about the vows that we have made, both at baptism and as well as at ordination, we are saying yes to Hebrews 12. The Lord chastens those whom he loves, that we might be partakers in his holiness. A new level of set-apartness set <laughs> not for our own sense of satisfaction, but so that the healing mercies of Jesus might come through again and again and again. Amen.